This podcast is sponsored by nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming yet another bucket list interview. It's been a it's been a while in the making. I'm going to be talking to Zane Busby. Zane, of course, um, has been in so many cult classic films. Um, oh God, Cheech and Chong's Up in Smoke, where she played that crazy girl. You know, the two crazy girls that they pick up like about 48 minutes into the movie. Uh, she was in Americathon, uh, National Lampoon's Class Reunion, cracking up with Jerry Lewis, that hilarious scene where she's got the annoying nasally voice, you know, as a waitress. Uh, this is Spinal Tap. She directed Charles Grodin in Last Resort, which was a National Lampoon's Vacation kind of rip-off movie, which I love, by the way. It's a great movie. And um, she uh, co-wrote the, the uh, pilot that uh, Mac and Jamie did, All Night Radio. She um, you know, directed every sitcom you could think of back in the late 80s, early 90s. And she is a humanitarian... Um, helping Holocaust survivors. She's uh, got a nonprofit organization called the Survivor, Survivor Mitzvah Project. And we're going to talk about all of that stuff today. And it's going to be just amazing, you know. Um, <clears throat> like I said, you know, I grew up a huge fan of her. And the fact that I'm going to be talking to her today is just amazing. You know, I reached out to her a year ago, and I think there was some skepticism. I'm not sure, but um, I convinced her to come on today, and I'm so happy that I'm going to get to finally talk to her. And it's going to be great. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Zane Busby. Hey, Zane, welcome to the show. How are you today? Okay, how are you? <laughs> I am spectacular. This is such a wonderful honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, my pleasure. So, go ahead. What's happening? Oh, <laughs> nothing much. So, going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting and show business early on in your childhood? Very, very early on. <clears throat> all I ever wanted to do. Except I wanted to be an archaeologist for a very brief period of time. <laughs> yeah, did you used to go to museums as a kid? Yeah, because I grew up in New York, so it was a great place to grow up because they have every museum, you know, in the world, and they have Broadway. So <clears throat> that time, you know, you could go, when I was a kid, you could go to a Broadway show and sit in the balcony for like 12 bucks. So I saw like every Broadway show from the last row in the balcony where the seats were, you know, really cheap. And um, it was a great, you know, you saw everybody, you know, everything. Yeah, 12 bucks was a lot of money in those days. Now it's probably like 200 bucks, right? <laughs> I can't even imagine what, what the last row in the balcony is. Yeah, it's probably very, very expensive. Um, and they didn't even mic the shows then, you know? I remember seeing uh, Gypsy with Ethel Merman. Mm -hmm. And when I was a kid, you know, she had a voice like, like, you know, level a house, you know, like a foghorn. Yeah. And, you know, we could, we could hear her fine in the back row. She, she didn't have any mic. Yeah. Amazing. So. <laughs> And then I did a lot of summer theater. You know, I would be an apprentice when I was a, a kid, you know, from the age of like 11 to like 14, I apprenticed, which is a great way to start because you get to see traveling shows that come through and you get to see them over and over again. Mm -hmm. You get to kind of study their performances and see how they do the backstage stuff and see how all the, you know, the sets, you know, and costumes work. And um, you just get to see the same thing over and over, which is a really wonderful thing. You know, it's like when I was a kid also, they had a thing called Million Dollar Movie. Yeah. And I've heard Whoopi Goldberg talk about this, but uh, this is Ed Martin Scorsese. Yeah. He'd come home from school and at 3 o'clock there'd be a movie on Million Dollar Movie that would play for the whole week. So if it was like King Kong, you saw King Kong, you know, a million times. And then if it was, you know, Red River or, or uh, Drums Along the Mohawk. So you saw all the classic films, but you really, really saw them. You could study them. And that was another great thing, you know, so they had that, and then they had the early show, which was, um, if you did your homework, you could watch another movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, all you had was movie theaters was in those days. Very much, yeah, steeped in, um, uh, you know, show business and acting and writing and directing from a very early age. Yeah, did, did you do uh, musical theater a lot? I didn't do musical theater a lot, although I did some, but, um... When I went to college, I did uh, musical theater, and I also did, um, 
know, all kinds of plays. I think I did 80 shows when I was at, at Hofstra because that's a really good education as well because they start with, like, the Greeks and you go all the way through Elizabeth and everything, all kinds of comedy and the group theater and you come up to the present. So you really get a good education, which is important, you know? Yeah. Did you do any improv? Oh, yeah, tons of improv. Absolutely. Yeah, because um, you... We had a... Yeah, we had a... Uh, I think it was, um, I worked at La Mama once with Megan Terry. There was a, a show that we did in college called Comings and Goings, which was a total improv thing. Yeah, improv is great. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're so good at comedy. I was like, there's no way she didn't do improv. She is really good at it. Oh, thanks. Yeah, my cousin, my cousin said, you know, I come from a very funny family. I mean, everyone is a good storyteller and they're, you know, riotous. My grandfather was screamingly funny. But my cousin says, you know, comedy is like having curly hair or throwing a left hook in bowling. You're either funny or you're not, you know, <laughs> which is true. I mean, there are there are people who are not funny people in real life who can act funny, you know. I mean, Woody Allen is a very serious person in real life, but, you know, he's very funny. Uh, Helen Hunt is serious, but she's very funny. You know, there are people that can do it on an acting level, but a true, you know, uh, comedy person is, uh, you know, born, not made. Oh, yeah. Christopher Guest, he's very serious in real life, I've been told. Yeah, there are people like that, you know, but then, you know, give them comedy to play and it's a different ball game, you know? Absolutely. Um, and, and it's just, it's so great because when you're working with someone, like I worked with Charles Grodin and, and he was like a dream to work with, you know? Because mm -hmm. he would, you know, we'd do a series of takes and, you know, what can we do different? You know, what what, what we miss, you know? What could be funnier? You know, constantly looking for the next funny thing. But in an improv situation, he was hysterical. You know, yeah. absolutely hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> so were, were you born with the name Zane? Yes. Yes, I was named after a grandmother who died two weeks before I was born, who was Zipra. Okay. Yeah, I thought maybe, you know, that was a nickname because you play such zany characters. <laughs> yeah, that's the unfortunate part, you know. Um... When I was a kid, I changed my name like seven times because uh, <laughs> Doro was on the air. It wasn't a cool name to have when you're a child, you know? Oh, yeah? What were some of the names you changed it to? Oh, God, I, I think I was Rachel for a while. I was <laughs> Ginger. I was Sugar. I was, uh, <laughs> I mean, you name it. I saw Theodora. I liked that one a lot. Um, you know, trying to find something. Yeah. <laughs> so what... <laughs> So when you attended Hofstra, were, were you there the same time as Billy Crystal? I didn't know Billy went to, I know Billy. Did he, he went to Hofstra? Yeah. You're kidding me. Now i got to call him up. Yeah, as a matter of fact, oh, I know. one of his HBO specials was shot in the Hofstra Auditorium. Are you kidding me? No. All right, I have, that is crazy. No, I know him from Catch a Rising Star. I met him, like, probably in 1972. Yeah. He was part of a three-man group called The Untouchable. Right. And Larry Bresner, who ended up being his manager, who was a good friend, uh, you know, just spotted him and thought, oh, my God, this, this guy, you know, he should be on his own. And then, you know, took him under his wing. Yeah. I had no idea he went to college. Now, the people who came to form me at Hofstra, because it was such a good place to learn, was um, Francis Coppola, yep. so many years before I was there, and uh, Madeline Kahn, Christopher Walken, they were right. all the Laney Kazan, right. that group, you know, because, uh, you know, the, uh, the education you get there is unbelievable. When Francis Coppola had um, Zotrope in L.A. for a very short period of time, mm -hmm. he invited me to, to come hang out, right, when he was shooting um, One from the Heart. Oh, yeah. And he turned to me and he said, it's just like Hofstra, right? And I said, yes, because they had, you know, just, you know, a small theater, a rehearsal theater. You know, he was using scrims and theatrical techniques. And, you know, it was exactly like Hofstra. You know, and he was like, the, he used to do a lot of musicals at Hofstra. Oh, yeah. Wow, that, yeah. that's amazing. So you... Yeah, yeah. So you were, you were majoring in the performance and dramatic literature there? Yeah, I got a yeah, double degree. And you, uh, were you writing, too? Not so much then, a little bit, but not so much then, you know? Mm hmm We had a, we had a, there was an amazing professor. I mean, you know, you're lucky if you get, like, one or two 
teachers that are just astounding in your life, you know? Yeah. And at Hofstra, there were, there were quite a few. Two of them come to mind. I mean, uh, Dr. Miriam Tulin was a genius. I mean, just... She, you know, she turned you on to things that you would never know, like designers, you know, like Maholi Nagi, who did these things, you know, these amazing designs. And, and um, then there was um, uh, Sigmund, Dr. Sigmund, and, and Dr. Howard Sigmund, and his class was, was um, dramatic literature. And it was so good, and it was like at 8 o'clock in the morning, right? Right. That people, like, got up extra early and ran to it, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was so good. It was so moving. It was so incredible. And it was inspirational. So, you know, you just can't do better when you get that kind of an education. It yeah. really does prepare you, you know, for right. everything except the business side of show business, which, you know, they should have had some courses in that. Because when you when you actually graduate and you're out in the world, you know, you kind of don't know much about the business side, you know? Yeah, well, I think a lot of the, the newer acting classes these days, I think they're educating uh, people on the business side now, but uh, they definitely needed it back then. Yeah, we knew nothing. Absolutely nothing, you know? Right. And, um, you know, they don't call it show fun. They call it show business because it is a business, and it's a very hard business. And the more you know about the business side of it, the better off you're going to be, you know? Exactly. Um, and there were so many things that I learned when I was on the directing, producing side that I wish I had known when I was on the acting side, you know, like about auditioning and things like that. That, you know, wow. Yeah. I had known. <laughs> <laughs> you know, most, most actors think, oh my God, I don't want to audition, they're going to hate me. I mean, you come in kind of with all that insecurity. And actually, it's the absolute opposite is true. The people in the room, you know, who are auditioning you, they want nothing more than to find the person. They're dying for you to walk into the room and nail it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it is a really welcoming atmosphere. So, like, you know, that's like something I, I, have, I didn't know. Yeah, you got to show that um, you're you're easy to work with and that you know you're professional and all of that stuff. You know, because that's a big part of it. You know, um, being easy to work with. It's not so much the talent. Yeah, well, it's a lot of it's the talent, but you you can't also be an ass. You know, you've got to be yeah. easy to work with because, especially in a serious situation, that thing could go on for ten years, and no one wants to work with someone that's not, you know, a team player. But um, you know talent you got to have the talent to be able to do it and that's a that's a big thing too what a, what a lot of people don't realize is when they're in that room that audition room for their three minutes or whatever it is mm -hmm. they should really take it you know take those three minutes and i mean sometimes for example someone will uh, do an audition and, and they usually supply a chair right and they'll take the chair and they'll you know they, they don't want to use the chair so they turn it against the wall and they, they do their audition standing up and then that person leaves, and the next person comes in. And sometimes people sit down in that chair, even though it's facing the wall. And yeah. they do the audition, and it's like, what? <laughs> you know what I mean? They don't yeah. even understand that they, they can rearrange the room. You know what I mean? They could, they could stand on the desk. They could do whatever they want. It's their five minutes. They should use it. So that would be my advice to anyone. It's your five minutes. You know, use it. Be inventive. Mm -hmm, that's good advice. So Yeah. So how so how do you go from there to uh, working at Apple Films? Oh, this is this is weird. So I I lived in Manhattan after I graduated college, and I saw an ad in the Village Voice, right, mm -hmm. for um, a um, a script supervisor on a on a you know I, I don't even know if it was a student film or just a film, right? Right. And I thought, oh, and it was the pay was twenty eight dollars a week, which was like even then like what <laughs> terrible, right? <laughs> Yeah. So I thought I should do that, because um, I always loved editing, and I wanted to be an editor at one point, and I did a lot of editing. And I answered that ad thinking that, even though I didn't know at that point what a script supervisor did, that if I got the job, I'd find out, you know? Right. I always, I always thought, you know, I could probably do brain surgery if, you know, I learned how to do it. <laughs> you know, just give me, give, me, give me the tool, so I'm not afraid of it. So I go to this place, and actually, the guy who um, is the director of this is John Avnet, that he went on to do ris Risky Business, right? Right. Which is really funny. This was like his first film. And one of the stars of that film was Richard Gere, mm -hmm. who was his, his first film, right? Right. And it was just like a, a ridiculous, you know, student film. And, um, but I knew immediately Richard Gere, I said, I'll wrap that guy up, you know. Yeah. He's a lobster stardom, you know? 
And yeah. after that was over, I worked with I worked on the editing of that film for a while. Um, and I got a call from somebody that said, you want another editing job? It's a union job. You could probably get in the union from it. Um, it's, it's the Harrison Music Hour. I didn't know what that was, you know. Right. I said, sure, you know. So mm-hmm. they said, well, you have to go over here on 8th Avenue. I said, okay. So I go over to 8th Avenue. And a couple of blocks ahead of me, I see George Harrison. Now, I'm still not putting this together in my mind. You know, I'm just thinking, <laughs> oh, my God, a Beatle, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no one to tell because I'm walking alone, right? Of course. So I noticed that, that he turns on 8th Avenue. I turn on 8th Avenue. And he, you know, uh, goes into this building. And I look on my paper. It's the same building. And then he gets me. And I was, like, in love with him when I was in high school. You know, I was John and George, you know? Mm-hmm. So he gets in the elevator, and I thought, oh, crap, now I'm going to get in the elevator. So, okay, I get in the elevator, and um, he presses 5, and I look on my paper, it says 5C, you know. Mm-hmm. I let him get out, and I, I, I see what door he went into, and it's the same door, right? So right. then I get out of the elevator, and I knock on that door, and the door opens, and looking at me are Bob Dylan, George Harrison, and Leon Russell. And the Harrison Music Hour was a concert for Fondler Fish. That's what they called it. I went, oh, wow, this is amazing, you know? Yeah. It was supposed to be at that time, it was a two-week gig, right? Mm-hmm. Because it was shot on 15 millimeter. they were going to air it on TV, and Fabergé was going to be the uh, sponsor. And then when they realized what they had, they went, wait a minute, we should do a feature. And it was like the first film that was done this way, they actually blew up the 16 millimeter to 35. Mm-hmm. And um, they made it a feature film. So my two-week gig lasted for eight months. <laughs> <laughs> and it was fantastic because I got to work with all these people, you know. And uh, I learned a ton of, of stuff. And I learned, you know, all about editing. And um, it was a great experience. It really was. I'm glad it got released theatrically because I think it's one of the most put to- most well-put-together concert movies of all time. Yeah, it was great. And it's, um, there's a bunch of funny stories from that movie. There's um, Bob Dylan, right, who was like an idol of mine. Yep. Had in his contract that he could cut his three songs, right? He had total control over the cut of the song. Mm-hmm. And you know Dylan, he's not like into anything fancy. He just like, you know. Anyway, he, he cuts his three. Then he goes off to make a movie. And then the rest of the film was cut. And then when they put it together, you know, they looked at his stuff, and it was just like not utilizing a lot of the shots, you know, because there were eight cameras, two performances, so there were 16 cameras. You know, mm-hmm. lots of shots to pick from, right? Yeah. But on the, on the, there was an early show and a late show, and on the early show, two of the cameras, one was out of focus, and one had like a, it was a big wide shot of Madison Square Garden, and it had like a wire hang right in the center of it, Right. Right. And it was huge. You know, I mean, Dylan looked like a, you know, a raisin. I mean, you couldn't see his face or anything. But he picked that for a hard rain, like practically for the whole song. One big wide shot with a wire. And um, the song was like four minutes long. So they decided to recut it. So they recut it. And then they looked at Just Like a Woman and they thought, oh, look at all these shots we have of Eric Clapton and we have George and we have... Um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Leon Russell. We should use those shots too. So they recut that, and they were really good cuts, right? Right. And then um, they, I guess they called Dylan's agent or something like that, and and um, well, he didn't take the news very well because they kind of, you know, went behind his back and recut the film and didn't ask, you know. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> They look at me like I'm, I'm like 19 years old, and all the editors was like four of them. They look at me and they go, okay, so um, we're going out to have Cuban Chinese food. We'll bring you some. You're going to answer the phone. There's going to be a phone call in about 20 minutes. It's going to be Bob Dylan, and he's really, really pissed. <laughs> I said, yeah. And we don't want to get involved, so somehow you got to talk them off the ceiling. you know. And I'm like, what? You know? <laughs> like, first of all, I agree with him. It wasn't a very nice thing to do, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's so hilarious. They, they all leave, right? Yeah. And they leave me, and the phone rang, but they did Bob Dylan, and I'm the only one there, right? Right. So, um, so I let him advance, and he was right, and I said, look, you know, you're absolutely right, they went behind your back, baby, you cut it behind your back, but you know what? Because he said, I'm going to pull out, that's what he said. You know? Yeah. going to pull out of the movie. I said, but if you pull out, you know, you're not hurting them, you're hurting all the people in Bangladesh with this movie is born. And he was really cool about it. He said, you know, you're right. He said, let me just have a screen of it. I want to see what everyone's done. So we set up a screen for him, and he watched the whole thing, and he said, you know, he gave it his blessing. But, you know, that was my introduction to that. Um, and so, out of 
talk to someone else is doing. But he was, you know, he was great in it, and you know, it stuff is great, you know? Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, my God, that is so funny, though. Uh, so what year did you move to L.A.? I moved to L.A. with a rock and roll band in 1976. Uh-huh. I guess 76-ish. Yeah. 76 probably. And we had a show that we did, and we set it up at the, it was a, it was a band that had a lot of visuals in it, so we set it up at a sound stage, and we had an invited audience, so we wanted to get a record deal at that time. Yeah. That's what we did. And then while I was out here, I went up to some movies, and then I transitioned back into acting. That was, was Oh God the first movie, and I got my SAG card, and to get my yeah. Remember? Uh, you know, yeah. So, well, maybe, maybe he won't remember me. I was like hoping because, you know, what a horrible thing to do to someone, you know? Yeah. I've that in my mind, you know? So, um, so I, I, I could see he's staring at me, you know? So I walked over to him. I said, I said, welcome to the show, blah, blah, blah. I said, you know who I am? He said, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you were like a borderline Manson girl in that character. You know, God says it's okay. <laughs> yeah, God says it's okay. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and Carl just let me go, you know. I made yeah. one line and I just, like, made it bigger, you know. Yeah. And that's how I got my sad card, and that was the first thing I ever did. Wow. And then, and then you do um, Up in Smoke. Uh, was that another yeah. uh, audition? Yeah. We we came at it with no contact. But there used to be, and there still is a thing called the breakdown, where business managers get lists of all of the things that are casting. Mm -hmm. We have to be an agent or a manager. Yeah. Because by then, CBS had come to him and said, you know, we need someone 
said, like, you, we, we want to, like, revamp CBS. And by the way, we want you to make Tony Orlando hit. Yeah. He was like, you know, you yeah, try that. So, in any event, so he said he had an office at CBS at that time, which was a, with a line that ran into CBS. So he said, I will send you on this audition from CBS. And it will be, you know, it will sound good. So, he, he sets it up. And I go all the way out to Malibu. Now, I'm from New York at this point. I, I have no idea how to get around in L.A. Yeah. And people are giving me directions, like, you take Coldwater Canyon. And I'm thinking, how can you take a canyon? I mean, I know nothing. <laughs> I finally get there, and the room is uh, just, you know, like, eight guys with beards and long hair. And me, and they hand me this side, and it's like two pages of single space dialogue, I guess, right? Yeah. They say, okay, go. And I said, well, wait a minute. I didn't even read it. I don't even know. They said, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just a girl who talks too much. I said, oh, I got it. So I just, like, talked a mile minute and told them stories about this woman uh, who used to, like, be across the hall from me in the loft I, I lived in New York. And that, that scene actually got in the movie. It's called Fuck Me Out. And it's a, it's a scene in the movie. And, and they were hysterical. And um, they got cast in that part. And then the fuss began because I didn't know anything about the ballet or ballet girls or anything like groupies. I knew nothing. Yeah. I talked to Tommy. So I had to go. Go ahead. Tommy, go to, the, to the, um, the ladies' room at the Rainbow. Right. And you'll see what we're talking about. Yeah. But the ladies' room at the Rainbow, okay. I go into the ladies' room at the Rainbow and there's all these girls in there sitting in front of these mirrors and on the floor and the yak yammering away and putting on makeup, face <laughs> clothes, and I walk in like a normal person and they think that I'm a narc and the whole place is empty, right? Yeah. So I've got like a, a tape recorder in my purse and I got the glasses on and the pencil on the pad, you know, I'm doing my research. So I thought, oh, that's not going to work. So I called up a friend and I said, I'm stopping by your house. Do you have like clothes we can get all, you know, the feathers and all kinds of crazy stuff we can wear? So we're going, we have to go back to the rainbow. She said, okay. So we went back together. And well, then I was just one of them. And I got to um, totally get that character. Because the funniest thing about this character was that the, I thought they were all like in their 30s. Meanwhile, you know, they were like 15, you know, and their mothers were in their 30s. And they used to drop them off at the rainbow. You know, this is like crazy. While well, the mothers, you know, tried to find a guy. You know, go yeah. <laughs> so this girl comes in. There was, and there was also a payphone in the bathroom. So it was a very big bathroom. There was a payphone in the bathroom. So she comes in, and this is where I got the character from. She says, oh, I, I got to use the phone. I got to use the phone. So I'm, I'm so late. I'm so late. I got to call my mom. You know? Yeah. But I was, okay, here, here comes the biggest lie that we've ever heard of why she's late, right? Right. So she gets to the payphone, and she goes, oh, hi, Mom. Yeah, I'm like, you know, um, I'm really sorry I'm late. But, you know, we ran into some great flow. And like, you know, well, you know, you know how it goes, you know, and uh, no, I'm not going to get any for you. You know, she goes on and I go, oh my God, that, that's the answer. Yeah. So that was um, my introduction to, you know, the Valley Girl whole thing, and that's how the character got built. Yeah, I, I talked to Tommy Chong back in March. He's such a great guy. Did you have a lot of fun working with him? The both of them, they couldn't, they were sweethearts, you know? Yeah. Absolutely terrific, and most people, you know, a lot of that movie was done on a first take, you know? Yeah. Lou Adler directed it, he was great, he just let me fly, and, you know, they, they didn't mind if you wrote, you know, more stuff, which I did, and um, they were just very generous with the whole film. They were great to work with, absolutely, both of them, just terrific. Was that, was that marijuana van really a marijuana van? <laughs> we wish. <laughs> no, um, the Quaaludes that were real, though. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, got, I, I got them from the prop guy. They were real. <laughs> Not that we, we didn't take them, but I mean, they're, they're in the, you know. Yeah. They're in the... <laughs> That's awesome. I'm sure you get recognized for that movie a lot. Well, you know, it's, it's weird because I have a long red wig, right? Yeah. Because I noticed that, that a lot of these girls in the um, the bathroom at the Rainbow had red hair, right? Yeah. Color in. I can't. I don't know what it was. But I really didn't want to do anything to my own hair, so I went to like you know something like Home Depot when I got this spray paint that yeah. was like um, kind of like washes out with water. I said, okay, I can use that on my hair. It won't screw my hair up. 
And so I did. So, you know, after the film, and, you know, the, the hair is locked out, you know, people don't recognize it, you know? Right. <laughs> because he looked so different. But there was a girl who was an extra, and she came up to me, and she says, oh, you know, she, she, they all talk exactly the same. Oh, like, I love your hair. I'm like, how do you get it like that? And I said, oh, she said, this is that kind of, like, color that you put in, like, the highlights. And I said, no, no, it's like, oh, spray can. You get it the hardware store. You know, so then uh, I said, but I know. I, I would do it for a very long period of time. And then a month later, we saw this girl again at the Rossi for something. And her hair was, like, all, like, broken off. <laughs> she came over to me and said, well, you know, I did this, but you're right. I shouldn't have used it on my hair for that long because it all broke off. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I talked to Michael Mislove about Americathon. He's shocked that I even knew this movie. And I was like, yeah, it used to be on HBO like every other day when I was a kid. Um, how did you um, How did you get involved with that movie? They saw me, um, they saw me in Up in Smoke. And mm. I actually knew the director because he was also, uh, he went to high school with my sister, but I didn't, we didn't put it together, but, you know. Neil Israel. But, yeah, Neil Israel, right. Yeah. And that was a whole other thing to find that character and, you know, to get that accent and to realize who she was. And that was a really fun movie to do. And unfortunately, when that movie was made, Peter Riegler played a very important part in that movie and they cut almost the entire front of the movie off, which was he was a professor of sitcom at mm -hmm. UCLA, right? And he was studying, like, you know, the culture. And it was a very intelligent movie. At one time, you know, it was all about culture and, you know, craziness mm -hmm. and changing America and all this stuff. Because if you recall anything, you know, there's a time when, when there's no more gasoline and uh, so all the, all the freeways are just um, people's cars without the tires on them. Just people are living in their cars and, you know, America is broke. And uh, in Vietnam is like, you know, Paris and it's got lots of money from the, the, uh, all the, the money for repatriation money. And so a lot of things came to fruition, you know, like America did go broke and, you know, all these things happened. So it was a very small movie. Then Animal House came out and the people at the studio thought, oh, we should make it more, I don't know, I guess, juvenile. Yeah. So they put George Carlin voiceover, they cut the whole part of the movie and they 
stayed at the um, at the telethon with these crazy stupid acts for most of the movie, which is a shame because there is a really good adult movie in there that's a really good satire about America. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how was working with John Ritter? one of those great casts that you can only see, you know, once in a lifetime. Harvey Corman. Harvey Corman is hysterical in that movie. Yes. Well, he was, he was hysterical in everything. <laughs> right. I mean, he, he is one of the fun, you know, was one of the funniest people on the planet. And he's great in that movie. And he had so much more because he played the Jerry Lewis character with, you know, kind of breakdown on the air during a telephone, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, You're my uh, fourth guest from National Lampoon's class reunion. Um, oh. How was making that movie? Wait, who else did you have on? Uh, Barry Diamond, Wendy Goldman, and Muse Small. Oh, okay. Yeah, Barry Diamond and Wendy Goldman. Yeah, and Muse Small It was pretty much the same thing, you know, it was pretty much a blur, you know, I guess everyone had way too much fun on that movie. Yeah, I love how they, you know, big scenes with big cast, you know? Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of waiting around, there was a lot of, um, there was just a lot of craziness, there was a, a director who wasn't that experienced, there was, you know, there was, there was a, a lot of craziness on that movie. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, a lot of people think it's really funny, so that's great. It is, I, th- I think it's a funny movie. Uh, one of my absolute favorite things you've ever done is cracking up with Jerry Lewis. Oh my God, tell me about that experience. That was a great experience. I know that is a scene of pants, funny thing. It yeah. really is. Um, you know, so I have to say, you know, Jerry Lewis was one of the funniest people I've ever met. Uh, and Well, Bernie, pineapple, peach, you know, 
Yeah, I mean, I think in an otherwise hit and miss movie, I think that's the best scene of the whole movie, you know. And I, I, I crack up, you know, when you're when uh, you know he goes outside and then you're the doorman with the mustache. <laughs> Yeah, and then you show up at the end. Was was it a good yeah. movie? Was it a bad movie? And then all this right. <laughs> other stuff. <laughs> right, right, right. So yeah, so yeah, a lot. I mean, that that clip. There was a a club. It might even still be in Hollywood. Um, I think it's called Hollywood Hotel. It's like a club in Hollywood. Um, it's called Hollywood Hotel. It's in What was it like uh, working on Spinal Tap? Zane, you're breaking up a little bit. I can't hear you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's better. So then. <laughs> so then you directed Last Resort, which was a Roger Corman production. How did you get to direct that movie? And I got a call back from 
uh, the, I guess the, the secretary in, in what was the name of the, oh God, um, I'm trying to remember the name of their company, but it was Roger Corman. Concord Pictures. What was it? Concord. Right, right, Concord Pictures, right, right, yeah. right. So it was, it was, um, so it, it was, um, I'm sorry, so. It's Concord he Pictures. Said, send over your mm. stuff, you know, and I had very little stuff to send over, trust me, you know? Yeah. So I sent over some stuff, and I told her what my credits were, and she says, Roger wants to meet you, so I'm over. So I went, you know, to West L.A., and I sat there, and she turns to me when I got there, and she said, you know, Julie, his wife, is doing a comedy. You should really go up for that, because Roger does, like, you know, car crash movies and horror movies, you know? Mm -hmm. Um you should really um, go up for that. I'm going to put your stuff on that pile. I said, okay. You know, <laughs> she said, oh, and I love you and up and smoke. I mean, she knew my credit. She was great. So meanwhile, every once in a while, I see Roger Corman go from one office all the way down the hall to another office and come back with a ton of mail and go into his office and then go you know, all the way down and pick up another ton of mail and go into that. I said, I'm waiting like 40 minutes. I said, so what is he doing? She says, he's steaming the stamps off the envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> she says, they are the cheapest people on the planet. You yeah. know, <laughs> if you need a pencil, two pencils, they'll break one in half and you sharpen both ends. She says, if you do a movie here, you're not going to get any help or anything or any equipment or anything. But they told me that on this last resort movie that Charles Grodin, they had Charles Grodin. And I thought, how did they have Charles Grodin? I mean, I love Charles Grodin, right? Yeah. What is he doing in a, I, I know what I'm doing in a Roger Corbin movie, you know. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm doing. I'm trying to get my, my break as a director because he started so many directors because who else will give you your shot? No one, right? Yeah. But I don't know what he's doing here. He's already been in a million great movies. So that always like was like a question in my mind. Why was Charles Grodin involved in this movie? So anyway, they, I, I assumed the role of director, and I think it was between me, someone who was in prison, and someone else. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a very big group. Mm -hmm. and I get, and, and mm -hmm. we're supposed to all meet Charles Grodin, because he has like say over. So Charles Grodin picked me. So we started to work immediately on the script. And I'm thinking, you know, and I know that Charles Grodin lives in New York, and he's out here, and he was staying at Penny Marshall's house. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just wondering, oh, oh, before Charles Grodin came, this is great. Um, they took down all of the posters of the B-movies mm -hmm. in the hallways, and they put up, like, these art movies from France and, you know, fabulous award-winning, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, like, no trace of Roger Corman in here, right, to impress him, right? And I'm still wondering, why is Charles Grodin, like, involved in this? So it turns out that one day Charles Grodin comes in and he goes, my God, he closes the door and says, do, do, you, do, you, do you remember, um, do you know really what, what, I'm sorry, there was someone here just now. Mm -hmm. um, Well, you're going to have to pull up this big, glaring hole in this. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So, so Charles Gordon comes in and he says, oh, my God, do you know where we are? And I said, yes. He says, we're in, like, Roger Corman's place. I said, I know. What are you doing here? He says, I signed on when, when it was an HBO movie. I said, you're kidding. <laughs> so they had told us, and no one told him. So he figured, like, you know, it was still an HBO movie. So yeah. that's how they got Charles Grove. You know, they lied together. So anyway, so it, it turned out that, yes, you know, this movie was made for $250,000. They wrote the budget on a napkin. Yeah. <laughs> Julie and Roger Corman take the director out for, um, a, like, a, a meal, right? But they say you can only order the soup. So you have soup with them. And then you start your show, you're filming on a Thursday so that if the Dailies are bad on Friday. They will fire you and get a new director over the weekend. You know, they have it all worked out, right? Right. And it's all about saving money. So the minute I got the job, I started getting phone calls from people who had worked with Corman before, famous directors, and they would say things like, um, first of all, I don't know how they got my number, but they would say things like, oh, um, uh, 
never, ever, ever get behind because Roger will come on the set, and if you're behind, he'll just rip pages out of the script. doesn't matter what pages they are. They could be the best scene in the movie, and then say, well, now you're ahead. I said, okay, don't ever get behind. Okay, got that one. And then when I was editing, like two different directors called me up and said, make sure you have an even number of reels, projection reels. I said, why? He said, because if you have an odd number, they still have to make up the footage with the leader, and leader costs, even if it's blank, costs money, and Roger's not going to want to pay for the extra leader. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he'll reach into the box and he'll throw out one of your reels if it's not an even number. And it could be the end of the movie, it could be the beginning, it could be the middle, but you don't want that to happen, so don't do that. You know, So it was all these things like, oh my God. And they said, and whatever you do, don't let Charles Grodin close his eyes. I said, what? I said, never let him go to sleep. Never let him close his eyes for too long. Never, never. I said, why? What's going on? So it turned out that Roger was making this movie called Humanoids from the Deep or something like that, right? And it was right. all about like aliens who come to the beach, who land on the beach, and anyway, they, they impregnate Earth women in, in, you know, in some kind of crazy like outer space orgy. Mm-hmm. And when he shot the movie, um, he had, like, Anne Turkel and a lot of, like, actresses in the movie. And then he wanted some nu- nudity, so he hired body doubles and filmed, like, nude scenes with supposedly them, right? Right. <laughs> and for the big orgy scene. So when the actresses found out about this, they put an injunction against, against the film before it opened. And Roger had to remove all of this footage. So it's burning a hole in his pocket because... He cannot, cannot, cannot stand the fact that he shot this, he, he spent money on it, and now he can't, you know, use it. So yeah. he's been trying to stick it in a, um, in a, um, in a movie ever since, you know? Yeah. It'll be a dream sequence if you let Charles Grodin close his eyes. <laughs> yeah. So that was like, oh my God, you know, there were so many things that you had to watch out for, you know? So many crazy things in that movie, but... You know, and then the final thing was we finished shooting. We shot it in like 18 days or 17 days. Mm-hmm. And, you know, no set, no this, no that, no equipment. You know, they say, oh, here's the key to the equipment room. And you go in and there's a light stand in there. You know, there's no equipment, you know, so like you get it yourself, you know. And uh, they had gotten a, um, a location on Catalina for us to shoot. Mm-hmm. And, but there was no electricity. There was no boys camp. So... You know, and they, and they wouldn't let us have a generator. So I said, so what are we going to do? You know, and, oh, you'll figure it out. So then one day Roger calls me up and he says, well, you know, uh, Zane, uh, we found out that a there's a woman who is in an iron lung who lives on a yacht in the harbor that you're going to be shooting at. So we're going to give you like $100 to hire a diver to go tap into her power. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> like, what is, yeah, we killed this woman. Just get the shot. You know? So, yeah. We didn't do that. You know, they figured that the director will pay for the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the electricity for themselves, which is what happened. But we finished shooting this movie, and the day after we shoot, we haven't started editing it or anything. I get like three calls from people in the cast saying that their uncle in like Arizona saw it on the Z channel or something like that. I said, yeah. what? And I, I said, you know, it can't be. I mean, there's no way. No, no, no. They described that Charles Grodin's on a horse and this happens. I said, that's impossible. And then like someone else calls. I said, all right, I've got to get to the bottom of this. Turns out there was something in the contract with the writers that if it aired on television before it aired in the movie theater, they wouldn't have to pay the writers $75,000. So they took the work print, you know, just like the dailies, and aired it on the Z channel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, wow. anything to save a book. I mean, and someone should make a movie about that. But that's what you're up against when you make a, you know, a movie for the Corman. But I must say that after that, if you get a, a script that's typed, if you get a, if you get like pencils, if you get, you know, anything, a three-hole punch, you know, with Brad's in it for a script, you know, you're thankful. So when I started doing television, I mean. There was nothing that was terrible because I had already been through the worst that you can imagine, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, so I'm yeah. kind of grateful, you know, for everything else. Yeah, you gave you gave a lot of um, big stars of today um, like their first movie role in that movie, like Megan Mullally and Mario Van Peebles and John Lovitz and Phil Hartman. Wow, that's a great cast. Yeah, my, si- yeah, my sister helped me um, do some casting and... Um, 
she actually spotted John Lovitz in an acting class, and she says, I don't know, she says, do something, write a part for him, you know? Yeah. So what happened was, you know, we got John Lovitz, and uh, Charles Brown, uh loved him, too. And while we were doing the movie, and we wrote, we wrote a part for him. I mean, that wasn't in the film, you know, the bartender. Mm-hmm. And uh, Bill Hartman, I had been, I had done something with Bill Hartman, so I knew him. And his scenes were totally uh, improv with Chuck Roden, which is a you know, great scene when, you know, he comes on to him. So mm-hmm. that, that's another actor. There, there, were, there were a lot of really great people in there um, that, uh, that we found. But while the movie was being shot, Groden called Lauren Michaels and said, look, I got this kid on this movie and yeah. it's really funny and I know that you're um, going to audition for Saturday Night Live in L.A., you know, can can we just send you some film? And I think they said, no, he's going to have to come in, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, God. Not telling the Cormans, we like shipped John Lovitz on some ferry, you know, off to audition for Saturday Night Live and he got it and he came back and finished the movie. That's, so that's, we that's, did start his career, and um, yeah, but it, it, you know, it, it was great because I mean, you were on literally an island with nothing. There was buffalo on this island. There was barely any amenities at all, and yet there's no way to make it a good movie. But it's, it is a funny movie, you know. It's very funny, you know. He, he's smoking marijuana. <laughs> Just love that to right. see Groden do that. Right. You know, they take mushrooms. You know, he, he, I mean, there's just like. You know, it could never be a good movie because, you know, we didn't have the ability to make it a good movie. But um, Mario Von Peebles was great. Uh, but, it, it, you know, I had the ability to at least make it funny. So, uh, I mean, Groden thought it was the funniest movie he was ever in. He, he loved that movie. Well, vac- oh. Vacation was out at the time, so I'm sure that was the model for this movie, right? Uh, you know, family Vacation. I never saw those movies, so I have no idea, you know? Okay. I have no idea. Um, I was just trying to get... Oh, the other thing was you have to be in it, which was a little schizophrenic. I mean, they don't make it easy for you, but like I say, once it's like Baptism by Fire, once you make a Corman movie, mm-hmm. you definitely, um, you know, can live through anything. <laughs> that was good. It's just I wouldn't do another one, you know? Right. Be suspect of someone who does two, you know? Right. Why would they? So after all, you did all those, you know, sitcoms as a director or what have you, yeah, since then you've dedicated your time to helping Holocaust survivors. What triggered that for you? I had done like a million shows this one year and I had done a bunch of pilots. I was absolutely exhausted. I was going to go to Hawaii, which is what I usually do, like spend a couple of weeks, you know, three weeks or a month in Hawaii to just like revitalize and come. And she said, you know, there's a really interesting thing going on in Lithuania. It's the first return of um, Jewish people who um, whose families were killed in the Holocaust and no went through the Holocaust. They're coming back to Lithuania to get recognized by a government who just basically said we had nothing to do with this when they did, you know? Mm-hmm. And she said, it might be interesting for you because I'm very big on history. I mean, all kinds of history. I mean, World War II, the, the British... Um, you know, the prisoners of war camps. Uh, I went through all these periods, the Civil War, you know, I mean, all kinds of history I'm interested in. So this fascinated me, this particular period of history. So, and I had two grandmothers who were born not far from where I was going. One one in Belarus and one maybe in Lithuania. So I went by myself, right? I just mm-hmm. had to go. And when I, this is in 2001, if you can imagine, September 2001, right before 9-11, and I didn't realize that Belarus was like a communist country and you needed a visa to get into it. <laughs> so um, I got stuck in Lithuania for like four days, which was actually a happy accident because I met some people there who put me, who said to me, hey, if, if you're going to go along the back roads and try to find where your grandparents are from, um, there are Holocaust survivors in these little towns and villages um, living in poverty and they would really appreciate it you know, a visit and maybe you could bring some food and maybe you could bring some American dollars and maybe you could bring this and maybe you could bring some sweaters and maybe, you know, this whole list. I said, okay, fine. So I did that and I crossed the border into Belarus and it was like going back in time like 200 years. I mean, there were no cars, there were no, uh, there was no electricity, there were, you know, there were bullet holes in the walls of all the buildings. It was like the war happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I met these Holocaust survivors who I, of course, I 
couldn't speak directly to. I needed a translator. You know, these old men and women who were like literally, when I would knock on their hut, because they live in a wooden, little wooden hut made of like wood and straw and mud. And I would knock on these doors and um, they, were, they were all out back because it was September. They were on the ground trying to dig up potatoes because if they didn't get their potatoes up before the frost came, they wouldn't have a winter food supply. And I thought, what is wrong with this picture? You know, I always thought all these Holocaust survivors were taken care of when they came to the United States. I didn't know they were still there, you know? Right. So I would, you know, talk to them and they would always invite us in. And I'd ask them about themselves and decide to tell me these stories that are just unbelievably incredible. Because these are not people who were in concentration camps. These are people who, like, fought in the forest. These are people who went underground. These are people who went on these death marches. These are people who had a whole different experience. And um, it fascinated me. So I met, like, eight of them. And then when I got back and I was directing, I would just send money every once in a while in an envelope, just cash, you know, and I didn't even have to speak the language. I would just draw a big heart and roll up some cash and send it along, thinking that, you know, that maybe they won't remember who I am, but it, it would help them, you know, if, they, if the money got to them. And then little by little, I started getting these tiny notes back written on little torn pieces of paper, like your letter was like a, a beacon of light in the darkness and things like that. And I went, whoa, what is this, you know? Right. And these people started writing back to me. And then I got some translators and said, okay, I want to write a real letter and I want to find out what happened. And then the floodgates, you know, opened and these people wrote me 10, 20 page letters about their experiences. And then I thought, oh, I got to go back. So I went back and we found like another, you know, 25 people. And then I incorporated that. And then some people over there found another 40 people in a different country. And the whole thing grew from these eight survivors. And now we have 2,500 survivors in nine countries. Wow. And it's uh, been an incredible experience because I go there. I try to go every year, but, you know, haven't gone in two years now because of the pandemic. But, you know, you can, you know, take your cameras and go through the forest and, you know, come across, you know, places where people lived underground. It's still like that, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the most undocumented piece of his, history in the world. So I have just been filming and filming and interviewing and amassing this stuff. And now I'm looking for funding so that we can actually edit all this material. And, you know, I have over 500 hours of video and get it out to schools and universities because people should know about this. People should know about what went on in Eastern Europe, you know, not so much Central Europe, but Eastern Europe during the Holocaust because it's a totally untold story. And it's, you know, amazing, you know, you know, bands of teenagers who were partisans in the woods. I mean, just great stuff, you know? And yeah. to hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, you know, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. So, yeah, so it became a humanitarian effort and an educational effort. And on the humanitarian side, you know, for these people who have experienced literally the darkest days of human history, it's a pleasure to actually do something nice for them and give them money for food and medicine and heat and whatever they need and also to just befriend them because they do not have any kind of um, a family, because they, usually they're the sole survivors, you know, so there, there is no one else. Their communities were destroyed, their homes were destroyed. So when you think about it, and I always try to put myself in their position, you know, what would it be like to go through a catastrophe like the Holocaust, where your entire family is massacred and, you know, you are treated like, you know, dirt and you're tortured and everything. You live through it at a young age, right? Right. And then you go through life without one person who knows you from before the war, without one person who loved you, without one person who knew your family, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it's, it's like incomprehensible. So I just thought that in this world, which has become a cruel place, you know, especially, you know, now, there's a lot of cruelty going on and people are not nice to each other, that it's a, it's a good, people want to do good things. And so I'm, you know, I try to get as many people as possible to donate to help these people because 100% of the money that we take in is given directly to a Holocaust survivor. It's not one of those charities where none of the money gets to the people. You know, we carry it over there ourselves. So um, if anyone's listening, go to Survivor Mitzvah, M-I-T-Z-V-A-H dot org. And um, you can see films, you can see what we do, and you can donate, please. Absolutely. I'm definitely going to donate to that. I just uh, admire what you do um, with uh, that with that project. I mean, have you seen have you seen a, a, a progression um, in terms of how Holocaust survivors are treated as, as far as, you know, medical treatment and all that for PTSD? 
Well, unfortunately, over there, they're not treated at all. Oh. So here, you know, I mean, there's, there's a book that I read. I've never read a lot of books on this. Right after the war, um, some famous psychologist or something in Sweden, like, wrote a book. When these people got to Sweden, because that's where they brought them after the war to get well, some of them, they were interviewed, and they were not believed, you know? When, they, when people said, this is what happened to me, mm -hmm. they were told that they were obviously making it up because nothing could have been that horrible. Ugh. So they all shut up, you know what I mean? And this, this yeah. stress, and this, uh, you know, just went underground, you know? But now that they're older, you know, sometimes when you get old, you can't remember what you had for lunch, but you can very clearly remember your early life. And so this is all coming back to them, and it's kind of haunting them. So mm -hmm. I wish there was more of this, um, you know, psychological help for these people. But um, what I found also, which is really, really interesting, is these people are the most positive people I've ever met in my life. I haven't met anyone who's bitter. I haven't met anyone who's evil. I haven't met um, anyone who doesn't want a better world for all mankind. So when I encourage them to tell their stories, and I say, look, most of these people have never told their stories because they're petrified that they'll get in trouble if they say what really happened to them, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Because the perpetrators are still alive. They might be living next door, the people who killed their parents, you know? Right. So when we give them the opportunity to tell their stories for future generations, it's so cathartic for them that, that they are contributing to a, a wider dialogue on tolerance and understanding and goodness, you know what I mean? They, right. they love it. They love it. They think it's really, really important. It gives them it gives them a sense that they didn't go through all of this in vain, that people can learn from it, that, you know, people can learn what intolerance does, you know? And right. um, it's not just a little thing, you know. It, it can cause death and destruction, you know, that we're still not even uh, recovered from. So when we see it happening in our society right now, and there's a lot of intolerance, there's a lot of hatred, there's a lot of people yelling at each other, that this course is not friendly, you know? Yeah. That happens, you know, that they write to me and they say, this is like the clouds of war. This is the way it was right before the Holocaust. So there is like, you know, a warning, you know, to confront evil wherever it is and to really stay on the path of doing good things. Because when you do good things, good things happen. Exactly. Karma, as they call it. Uh, yes, exactly. Do you have anything upcoming uh, that you'd like to mention? Well, I am working on develop, uh, a, a film that's in development. It's a Vietnam story um, about, it's a true story about an African-American Air Force nurse in Vietnam and mm -hmm. um, named Captain Joan uh, Arrington Craigwell. And she's, she's 84 years old right now. And it's the most amazing story of, uh, not just heroism, but, Literally, I mean, she won the Bronze Star for her service, but it takes place in 1968. And um, it's all about America being at, at war with itself, which is what's happening today, you know? Yeah. But at that time, it was like the women's movement and the, the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement, you know, and the cultural shift and the music was changing. But um, and in the midst of all that, you know, all the young people were going to war. So it's quite a story. It's got an amazing message, and um, we're in the stage right now of working with writers. So that that'll be a really wonderful piece. Wonderful. I wanted to uh, mention uh, Mark Scheffler says hi. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, yeah I have. Yeah, I advertised on Facebook that I was going to be talking to you, and uh, he said, oh, I worked with her. Tell her I said hi. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Say hi back. Yeah, he's, he's, he's still doing stand-up comedy uh, wherever he can do it, you know, and yeah. It's I'll, not getting that easy anymore because you know, none of the comics like to go on campuses because it's all become like you can't say anything. No. You know? No, Jerry Seinfeld. I mean, the cleanest comedian in the business even said he doesn't want to do um, college shows because it's gotten so clean and it's terrible. Yeah, you know, it's terrible. And, and it used to be that you could be outrageous, you know, and that was where you know you could walk that line and cross that line every once in a while. Now, God forbid you say anything, you know, there's a there's a justice police on your head, you know. So yeah, it's not a good time for comedy. For that's for sure, and it's a shame because it's, it should always be a good time for comedy. Right. I mean, I left it three and a half years ago, and I'm glad I did because it's just, it was getting to you be... You left just in 
time. It was get, time. It was getting to be too much. Yeah, I'm hoping one day I'll get to do it again when you know the world returns to sanity. You know, and then I can handle Hopefully. all the all the you know wokeness and all that crap. But <laughs> well, that you know, it always swings. The pendulum swings always too far. You know, and then it'll swing back, and then somewhere in the middle it'll level out. But yeah, we're going through a very, very crazy. Yeah. It'd be crazier because it's also, you know, a time that, you know, we could be seeing the end of democracy, which is, you know, and if that's not an exaggeration because, you know, what, what are there, 9% of the world lives under a democracy or something? I mean, democracies don't last because I think what happens is in the educational system, and our educational system is terrible, you know, they stop teaching civics, so no one knows how the government works. So everyone is like pointing fingers, oh, the government's a bad thing. Well, what they forget in this instance in America, the government is us. We are we the people. So, you know, you can't point to the government and say, oh, it's, it's the enemy, it's the deep state, it's this, it's that, because it's us, you know, and if people knew how to make their government work for them, they'd get everything they need. Right. But, you know, it, it's, it's an us against them, but they don't realize they're fighting with themselves. So we have an opportunity here, you know, especially since I, I've seen so many Holocaust survivors, and I've asked the oldest ones, you know, some of them, if you, if you can imagine, I mean, I digress for a minute, but if you can imagine, these are the people I call the unluckiest generation, right? Yes. The oldest, you know, from the beginning when I started working, you know, were around for the Russian Revolution, if you can imagine that. So they lived under the czar, right? If they yeah. survived that, you know, they were, they were pogroms. If they survived that, there, there was uh, famines of the 1920s. If they survived that, there was uh, the rise of Nazism in the late 30s and the 40s, and the full-blown Holocaust and Hitler and the whole thing. And then right. after the war, there was, you know, Stalinization and, then, then, and uh, communism. And so I always ask them, so under all of these different things, like some democracy, you know, you've been under the czar and Stalin, communism and a dictator and this and that. What, you know, which one is the best? And they say, it doesn't matter as long as there's no war. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we can live, you know, peacefully. But that, it doesn't happen like that, you know. They, mm -hmm. they wouldn't care if they had a king and he was a good king, they'd be fine. Because the, who gets hurt is just the people. The people get hurt, you know. The people that are waging war, the, the um, you know, the governments of these countries and these factions, they don't get hurt, you know? Right. They don't get hurt. It's every living person on the planet who just wants to live in peace gets hurt. That's why it was so encouraging, and it always is when you see something like the, the Global Citizens Concert, you know? When you are reminded, you know, every once in a while that there are people on the earth just like, you know, us who want good things to happen and who are, are uniting together to make sure that this earth, you know, can sustain us. That's a really exciting thing. But, you know, have we have we come to it too late is the question. I, know. I, I truly believe, you know, having been around for the Vietnam War and for the student strikes and the activism that just went crazy when I was, you know, of age and then was silent for like the next like 35 years, um, that, you know, if, if you stay in the streets and you stay protesting and you stay active and you stay involved in your government and you vote and you do all those things, you know, you can make change for the better. There's no question. But if you're just living a selfish life, you know, it's not going to be a good one. <laughs> yeah, very well said, Zane. I agree. Well, I want to thank you for coming on today. I know you were on the fence about it for a while, but I think you did just, <laughs> I think you did beautifully. I really did. Uh, yeah, no, no, just, you know, um, uh, you, were, you were terrific. I liked your persistence. See, that's what won me over because you were persistent. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, I get praise for my persistence um, quite a bit. Yeah. And I think it's, one of the best things um, about me as an interviewer, at least. And, you know, sometimes it can be, you know, misconstrued as being pushy or arrogant or something. But, you know, I, I try to, you know, be respectful to everybody. Yeah, that's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. Um, so do me a favor. If there's a link to this or something, send it on to me. Absolutely. I sure will. I mean, we had, we had a couple sound issues, you know, uh, mainly when you were telling me the spinal tap stuff, you know, um, you know, your landline called and whoever was in the room with you picked it up. But other than that, right, right. You, other than that though, it, it'll be great. Well, you, you have yourself a great day and please stay safe and I'll be looking out for your, your projects. Okay. 
Okay, yeah, anybody again, just go to SurvivorMitzvah.org and um, or just Google me, it'll come up. And uh, uh, you can see a lot of great film there and donate and help. Thank you so much. Um, you take good care. You too. Have a great day. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Zane Busby, ain't she a sweetheart? Oh my God, what a great lady, huh? I just thoroughly enjoyed listening to her and, you know, crazy show business stories and then, you know, her passion for the political side and the Holocaust survivors and all of that. She is a treasure, national treasure and a gem. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past. Because the present sucks. Fire, dudes.